Welcome to our third installment of the MST MCAT Monday series where we're basically just trying to get a, you know, bird's eye view of what a section entails and then dive into a little bit of, of strategies we can use to really score, uh, meet, our, meet our goals uh, for, for high scores, what resources we can use, how we can tackle passages specific to this section. Um, and then, of course, at the end, we'll have Q&A. So, you know, a little bit more detail of what we'll cover tonight. We're going to start with an overview of the ChemPhys section directly from the AMC and talk a little bit about what that actually means. We're going to discuss some must-know topics for the ChemPhys section. Um, and these are just things that, yeah, of course, you're going to have to go through the entire content review that's required for the MCAT. But I like to, you know, nail down a few extremely high-yield topics that I feel are must-knows that you will absolutely need to know like the back of your hand for uh, the ChemPhys section on the MCAT. We're going to talk about some common mistakes to avoid because it's, it's really nice to know what not to do sometimes. And then we're going to talk about some testing tips and strategies because it's also nice to know what to do. Um, so, you know, both of those sections, I think, are going to be where we'll discuss most of the ChemPhys specific strategies. Um, and then we'll work through a demo passage towards the end, um, work through a couple questions, and then I'll open the floor for um, any questions after that. And I, I want to be as practical as possible um, because I think there's a lot of advice out there for the MCAT and it's kind of hard to, you know, really turn that into actionable items. And, and that's something I definitely realized as a, as a student myself. So I, uh, I, I definitely want to prioritize like pragmatic things that people can take away. And another note is that this webinar is really going to be geared towards folks who are just now starting to prep their whole MCAT uh, study plan, right? And, and really getting a feel for, for what the MCAT entails. So a little bit about MST before we begin. Um, we're a one-on-one -on -one online tutoring uh, service, which really serves pre-medical students all the way up to uh, residency. And so, you know, we tutor for the MCAT, we tutor for the USMLE step one, step two, which you'll take in medical school. Um, and we've been doing this for over 14 years. And the thing I love about MST, even though I've only been here for one of those 14 years, is that here it's really very much about the students. Um, everyone I've met here has been in it for the fact that they just love to teach. They love to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's kind of what brought them to medicine as well. Um, and that definitely, you know, rings true for me as well. I, I just, I, I'm here because I know what it's like to be in a pre-med student going through the whole MCAT process. And I, you know, I, I really like kind of forming those friendships with people I consider future colleagues and, and working together to really do the best that I know everyone can on this, on this exam. So we'll keep it moving to, to the chem phys section. So just a high level overview of what's actually on this section. Right, this is the first section out of the four sections you'll see on the MCAT. The other three being CARS, bio, biochem, and then the behavioral sciences section in that order. Um, and a lot of times ChemPhys can be kind of the most daunting section for some students because you're coming from, you know, the vast majority of students come from sort of bio heavy backgrounds and maybe not so much in the, the quantitative uh, sciences of, of physics. And this might strike students as, you know, particularly challenging because you need to deal with physics when you haven't taken a physics course for years or, or for a variety of reasons. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about throughout this webinar about how we can actually maximize what we study for, you know, doing well on this section. And, and I will hopefully try to dispel any like uh, anxieties about this section just merely because of physics, because it's absolutely not. Um, even though the, the section is referred to as chem phys, it's way more chem than it is phys. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So it's a, gonna be a typical science section. Science sections on the MCAT are 59 passage-based and discrete questions. Um, and you have about 95 minutes to do them. And you know this, there's gonna be out of these 59 questions, probably about 12 or so discrete questions. So that's, that's the breakdown. It's very standard for the MCAT. Um, just note that, you know, on the MCAT, most of the problems you'll be dealing with are going to be passage-based. So of note here for the subjects tested on this section, the chem phys section out of all the science sections on the MCAT 
actually out of all the sections on the MCAT, is particularly challenging because it covers the widest breadth of topics, right? So you're going to see 25% of the content on the chemist section is going to be from first semester biochemistry, 5% from intro biology, 30% from general chemistry, 15% from orgo, and 25% from intro physics. So if you look at this at face value, right, only about a quarter of this section, which is only a quarter of the MCAT, is on physics. So if you're not a physics person, don't freak out. You can still do extremely well on the MCAT. Um, but furthermore, I want you to pay attention to the fact that there is biology and biochem on this section. In fact, there's 30% bio and biochem on this section. So, you know, even though there is a dedicated bio biochem section, you know, later on in the MCAT exam, that's still very much a lot of those concepts are still very much fair game for the chem phys section. Um, if you go back to the, the title slide, the, the name of the section is actually the chemical and physical found, you know, sciences of the biological, um, sorry, the chem and phys foundations of the biological sciences or something like that. So it, it always relates back to biology. This is the MCAT after all. And, and um, it's very much not a, just a, a physics test. So that's a little bit about, you know, the content breakdown. And I just want you to keep in mind these things when you're planning out how, how you're going to dedicate your uh, study time, right? So I wouldn't dedicate 50% of your time dedicated to chem phys to studying physics because that's just not quite, um, you know, proportional to how it's represented on the test. Um, but this is really what I wanted to focus on here. So the skills tested on this section include the knowledge of scientific principles. And what that really means is just your standard kind of science uh, knowledge, right? This is what most of your, your, the exams you've seen in your life have been. You know, you, you study a unit and then you have a unit exam at the end of that unit where you're just basically testing if you, you understood the facts. The thing about the MCAT is that is only 35% of the test, right? So, almost 70% of the questions you'll be asked are going to be beyond just factual knowledge. And that can be a good thing for some students and, and maybe not a good thing for others. Um, but it's important we really acknowledge this and recognize what this means up front. What this means is that the MCAT is absolutely not about memorizing. It's not about knowing a bunch of stuff. Most of the MCAT is about problem solving and reasoning. And what can we do with that knowledge? We'll talk about it a little bit later, but really basically what that means is practice is way more important than content review. So that's probably the biggest piece of advice if you remember anything from this webinar, uh, and it's not even specific to the chem phys section, it's that you wanna do about 70% of your study time dedicated to practice and 30% dedicated to, you know, content review, the typical book reading, active learning, all that jazz. So, and, and that's really coming from the, the skill breakdown of the MCAT and coming from personal experience where I know that the MCAT is the type of test that really asks that you know your fundamentals and then you're good at using them to come up with answers. It's not a test that's about whether you know what the fourth enzyme in the Krebs cycle is and whether you know what, you know, yada, yada, yada formula is in, in physics. So it's very much about reasoning. And then that, that hopefully should be a, a anxiety reducer because it, it means that you do not need to be an encyclopedia of scientific knowledge to do really well on this, on this uh, exam. So what are those 70% that are not just knowledge based? So, so 45%, the vast majority of that is going to be scientific reasoning and problem solving. Um, another 10% is going to be reasoning about the design and execution of research. And another 10% is going to be database statistical reasoning. So this 20% is really going to be dealing with experiments, right? Their design and the analysis of their results. And then the other 45% is going to be dealing with scientific reasoning and problem solving. Really what I mentioned about knowing the fundamentals and knowing how to extrapolate what would happen next, right? If you know the properties of electrophiles and you're given a brand new molecule um, that has certain, you know, that that's negatively charged, you should be able to put two and two together and realize that, you know, this is probably going to be a 
not a good electrophile, it's gonna be a, a nucleophile, right? And that's just a, if, if those words freak you out, don't worry, it's very, very early in prep. Um, but that's really what I mean. It's, it's not about memorization, it's about knowing the fundamentals and applying them to new situations. Um, that really comes with, with practice. So just to wrap up, that's, that's just a general overview. I see a little notification in chat. Oh, that's just Jeremy. Um, cool, so we'll, we'll keep it moving. So yeah, so we just covered kind of what you'll, everything you'll see on the MCAT for the Compass section in terms of the you know, high level subjects and the skill breakdown for every single question. Um, that covers, you know, probably half of your content review book set that you might be getting, right? It, you know, chem, organic chemistry, gen chem, biochem, physics. That's a huge amount of knowledge. Um, and I would recommend that you, you know, and most people would recommend that you go through all of it. But I wanted to really highlight some of those must know topics because if you learn anything, if you really focus on anything, it should be these things because then you'll be able to answer the largest amount of questions and reason through the most amount of questions as well. Um, and so the first thing would be for organic chemistry, right? I, I start with this because orgo is notoriously, you know, before you enter college, that's like the notorious pre-med weed out class. It's like, you, you gotta be really afraid of orgo because um, it's just, it's a killer class, it's, it's so complicated. Um, what I wanna say about MCAT orgo is that it is not, likely not as bad as, or as difficult, I shouldn't say bad, as difficult as the orgo classes you took in, in college. So what that means is the orgo on the MCAT is a lot simpler. It's not going to go into as much nitty gritty about reaction mechanisms um, and, and really, you know, esoteric reactions as most of, you know, orgo college level coursework does. It's really, important though that you master the fundamentals and what i mean by the fundamentals are knowing as i just mentioned that example the properties of electrophiles the properties of nucleophiles and and just the basic reaction mechanism so for example substitution reactions um, these things are going to serve you very well throughout the mcat because you're not going to see too much more complexity to what you're dealing with. Um, if you're able to apply these general principles, you'll be able to deal with new reaction mechanisms that are thrown at you and figure out what happens. If you're able to point to uh, you know, a carboxylic acid derivative, you should be able to point to where the electrophilic site is and where the nucleophilic site is on the reactants. And then you can actually see how the nucleophile attacks and, and basically come up with a, the product. And, if, if what I'm saying to you right now is something that you're not comfortable with, then just write that down as something that you want to focus on. Um, but really, you know, with this little example here with Orgo, I hope I'm painting a picture about how high level fundamentals are more important than just memorizing the list, a list of electrophiles or a list of nucleophiles and, and just memorizing a bunch of reactions. It'll serve you more to understand the high level concepts and in a way, that's, that's less uh, time you need to spend in the books and more time spent practicing. So moving forward from must-known topics from Orgo uh, to Gen Chem, that's another you know, large piece of the Chem Phys section. I'd say here, you really want to focus on periodic table trends. So you know, electronegativity, atomic radii, a lot of these things are intertwined. So you, know, you can knock a few birds out with one stone. Um, and it's really important to understand the relationship between those because that'll come up in a lot of questions, right? If you understand periodic table trends, then you understand things about how, uh, a, a, about atomic chemistry. Then you also understand how um, chemical reactions might happen between different functional groups. And uh, so, again, this is a really fundamental high-level concept that, can, that you can use to answer lots of questions. Other things I'll say are, are redox reactions, know them well, know how reduction works, how oxidation works, how you can see what's being oxidized and reduced in an equation or in a reaction. And then finally, molar calculations. So, right, the chem phys section is the section on the MCAT where you have to do the most math. Some of it, a good deal of it is gonna come from the physics section, but actually a not insignificant, I'd say a substantial portion of it is gonna come from just 
simple molar cal calculations, right? Like we're all familiar with that, hopefully. The, the calculations where you have a, you know, you have this many grams of, of glucose, how many moles is that? Or, or calculations like you've got a, con a solution with this concentration, you take out this much volume, how many moles of substance do you have? Those types of molar calculations are extremely simple, but you want to know, uh, you want to get practice with, with doing them out, and you want to be very rapid and efficient and accurate in the way that you carry them out. So that's going to require some practice as well. Um, moving on, for biochem, you, you, I, I'd say the highest yield information for the chem physics section is acid-base chemistry. Um, and that's going to tie in a little bit with amino acids. But what I mean here is, is know your titrations, know how to read, you know, what a pKa means, what a pH means, what a pAOH means, um, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. All of these things sort of tie into acid-base chemistry. And then finally, physics. Right, I, I put this last because it's actually the least represented subject on the MCAT out of all these others. Um, what I really want to emphasize here is dimensional analysis. And if, for those of you that haven't ter heard that term before, dimensional analysis is basically just you know, analyzing an equation or a formula by paying attention to the units or the dimensions of the terms. Um, on the MCAT, since it's a multiple choice exam, you can really use this to your advantage. I've, I've answered MCAT physics questions when I have no idea what the actual underlying concept is or the formula that's necessary is just by doing dimensional analysis. What doing dimensional analysis takes from you, what, what you need to bring to the table in order to do it, is a knowledge of the basic and commonly derived SI units. So what I mean by that are Right for mass, the SI unit is is kilograms. For uh, force, the derived SI unit is a newton. What is a newton in terms of basic SI units? Um, you know, you can memorize that, or you can derive it by uh, the formula of F equals m a. Right? Um, we know force is written in newtons. We know mass is in kilograms, and we know acceleration units are. Uh, meters per second square. So therefore, a newton always breaks down into kilograms times meters per second square. And there I just used a formula to basically you know, break down a uh, uh, physics unit, like the newton. You could do the same thing with a joule or any other kind of derived SI units. Knowing how all those, uh, being able to interchange between basic and commonly derived SI units is the key to being able to do dimensional analysis dimensional analysis um, on the uh, chem phys section. So I would just start doing that early on, right? Get a list of all the basic and, and commonly derived SI units and just, just commit them to memory. Those are, those are one of the few things that you, know, you, you should memorize. And, and hopefully it's not too challenging because you've been working with these units for, for, you know, uh, since high school. And then in terms of actual physics concepts, I would say that kinematics and energy are probably the higher yield physics topics that you should focus your attention to. And they are going to, I, the reason I say focus your attention to is because they're going to require more of a conceptual understanding than some of these other physics sections. Um, you're going to see some questions on circuits and, and weirdly some questions on optics. I always thought opti like in my coursework, optics was something we just kind of brushed aside, but it's actually really important on the MCAT. Um, but the thing about circuits and optics is that you can answer most of the questions just by using formulas, um, just by, you know, having formulas at your disposal to use in, in certain situations and circuits and optics questions. Uh, you'll be able to get to get the right answer most of the time. There's not much conceptual thinking that accompanies these questions. That's obviously not a hard and fast rule. There, there are exceptions. But in general, I'd say prioritize the conceptual um, areas like kinematics and energy more than circuits and optics because you can just learn formulas that'll help you get the majority of the questions you see. And then for those of you that were uh, at the bio biochem webinar, um, you'll see this is a repeat from there. And that's because biochem shows up, you know, a, a, a good deal on the chem physics section. 
And you absolutely need to know all the amino acids for, you know, the chem phys and the bio biochem sections on the MCAT. So when I say know all the amino acids, I mean know their structures, know their one letter and three letter abbreviations, and know their, you know, functional groups. So know which amino acids are, are acids, uh, which amino acids are bases, um, which amino acids are polar and nonpolar. Um, it sounds daunting at first, and it was for me. I'm not very much of a memorizer. I, that's why I pursued engineering, so I you know, didn't need to memorize too many things. Um, but it's doable. There's only 20 amino acids. They break down into four pretty neat categories, and there's fun ways to do it. There's lots of mnemonics out there. I used this app called Amino Acid Quiz that was available on the App Store for free, um, and it basically gamified memorizing these things so that's something i would recommend just you know with these memorizing things start early and just make it a habit so that way you have that in your tool belt when you uh you know move forward in your prep cool so we'll keep moving and i don't think there's any questions cool all righty so common mistakes to avoid um, and I like to start with this before getting into the strategies, just because a lot of these things feed into sort of the, the strategy I talk about next. Um, but these are really similar to the, so, you know, even though this is a webinar focused on the chem phys section, these mistakes are really, um, I guess they apply to all aspects of the MCAT especially all the science sections. Um, and so, you know, there, there's going to be some overlap here. So I want you to not just, vote, you know, take these for the chem phys section, take these into consideration for, for everything you see on the MCAT. Um, a huge mistake, in my opinion, is skimming the passage at any point on the MCAT, right? We uh, typically students know not to skim the passage in a, in a section like CARBs. But what's less typically known is that you shouldn't skim a passage in, in, uh, in any science section either. Um, because so much of the MCAT, as I mentioned from the earlier slide, 70% of it is you know, reasoning and problem solving. Where do you do that reasoning and problem solving from? From the passage. Most of the MCAT is, is passage based. And so skimming the passage can be a disadvantage to you because you will miss kind of the central point or the main idea of the passage, which can really guide you down the, the line of reasoning that the MCAT is trying to you know, guide you towards and totally miss it by relying on, on outside knowledge. So I would recommend for every section on the MCAT, try to slow yourself down and read every passage carefully, reading for the main idea. That is something you can take for every single section on the MCAT, um, and it will serve you well, I, I guarantee it. You know, timing can be an issue, but I don't think that you should save time by whittling away your attention to the passage. Um, eventually, you will get faster at, at you, you will get better at analyzing the passage, which will make you faster. And you also get better at answering questions, where, which is where you'll, you know, shave the bulk of your time. Um, awesome. So another common mistake is to overlook the titles of figures and tables. You know, we see a pretty line graph and we're all STEM people, so I shouldn't generalize, you know, most of us are STEM people, so, you know, our eyes go immediately to the data, but never get in the habit of overlooking the, the title. The title, especially for the MCAT, is a great little cheat code to remember for these science sections because they are written in a way that really encapsulates the entire main idea of the figure table and you can really use that to your advantage. So um, whenever you see a figure or table, use the tap method to analyze it. Tap method is just a mnemonic for you to remember. Title, so read the title first, then look at the axes, that's the A. Um, understand the X and Y axes, what are the independent variables and the dependent variables. And then P is for pattern. So you know, start slowly and look for patterns in the figure or table try not to just take everything in at once. These, these figures and tables are gonna be really complicated. So really step by step in your kind of analysis of the actual data. Look at one line first, figure out what the trend is, then move on to the other line and so on and so forth, just as an example. 
Um, the third common mistake to avoid. This, this trips a lot of students up because it's really different than most of the um, you know, exams we've taken in our lives where it's really all about the knowledge that you bring to the table because we're testing, we're being tested for knowledge. But on the MCAT, using too much outside knowledge is actually a big mistake because a lot of times that means you've missed the point of the question. The MCAT, as I said before, is really about testing the fundamentals, right? They want you to come in, they want to test that you know the fundamentals of these different subjects, biochem, bio, physics, chem, and you're able to apply them within this reasoning in this passage. They don't care that you worked in a you know, cancer bio lab for five summers throughout college and your gap year, and you have this really niche kind of not, but deep knowledge that just so happens to show up on, on the MCAT, and you're like, oh, I know this thing, and I, you, you choose an answer based on that experience because, you know, of course, the MCAT is all real information, so you just have a leg up. You have an advantage. That's actually a big mistake. What you should always remember is that every single thing on the MCAT is designed to be answerable for the student that follows the AMC's guidelines and just, you know, learns the, the basics, the fundamentals, right? You don't need to have a PhD in neuroscience or cancer biology to answer any of these questions. If you read a, a full book set that we'll, we'll talk about resources later, um, and you, you retain that information, that is the scope of the knowledge that the MCAT is expecting you to have. Nothing beyond that. If you see a question, which you will, you will see questions that kind of ask you things that are definitely beyond what you saw in those books. You might think, shoot, like I just, I forgot that, or I didn't learn that, or that's outside knowledge I don't have. What's actually going on there is that there are going to be clues in the passage, steps you can take by building on those fundamentals and reasoning through them to get to the right answer. So that can actually be a confidence booster and something to keep in mind is that if you see something that you don't know and you're really confident in your content prep that you reviewed everything, look a little deeper in the passage. Look for the clue that should guide you towards the answer just by using those fundamentals and just by using those things that are within the scope of the MCAT. Um, so sticking to the theme of the passage and the scope of the passage can really help guide your reasoning here and try not to fall back on outside knowledge ever if possible. Um, by outside knowledge, I mean things that are, you know, just beyond the scope of the MCAT, things you won't find in your MCAT review books. Um, the other common mistake to avoid is not doing enough passage-based practice questions or just not doing practice questions in general. Um, most people spend, you know, the first couple months, most people study for three months. I'm not saying that everyone has to. Most people spend those two first two months or whatever reading the, the Kaplan books or whatever books you use and really just memorizing, making flashcards, and then the last month, diving into some full lengths. Um, what that shows is that most of your time was spent just doing content review, and, and actually a minority of your time was spent doing practice. I want everyone who's at this webinar to totally flip that, if possible. Spend the vast majority of your time doing practice questions. We'll talk about resources for practice questions in a second. And, you know, just the early phase of your prep should be devoted to exclusively content review. You know, midway through prep, do about 50-50 content review and practice, maybe even 40-60. And then for the third month of your prep, if we're looking at a three-month breakdown, should be completely practice. The thing to remember is that doing practice does not mean you're neglecting studying. Practice is the best form of studying. If you're doing it right and you're reviewing your questions, which is, you know, pointing out weaknesses and that's taking you back to your your books and you filling in those those knowledge gaps that's how you should be doing practice and um, that's definitely the best way to to study um, so so that's another common mistake and then finally neglecting the big picture this goes again for for all the science sections that all of these go for all the science sections on the MCAT but and it, you can hopefully pick up a theme I'm I'm, uh, I'm saying here is that the MCAT is not about memorizing a bunch of minute details and then doing well, hoping they come up on the MCAT. It's really about relationships, understanding the relationships in biology and biochem and physics, um, understanding how, how the fundamentals relate to each other and how you can use those to, to 
Uh, just be a good scientist and reason, make reasonable judgments with the facts you're given um, and the fundamentals about nature that you've learned. That's what the MCAT's about. It's not about minutia. It's about the big picture and relationships. So um, focus on, on those as much as you can. Stop and ask yourself how whatever you're learning fits into this larger picture of what you, of, you know, uh, for example, fits into this larger picture of, uh, um, you know, a theme in biochem or, or a theme in orgo or, or so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so, so those are common mistakes to avoid and a little bit on how to remedy them. Um, for recommended resources, I'll, I'll just touch on this because I was referring to them um, in the last slide. For content, what MST recommends and what I, I can absolutely get behind are is the Kaplan review books. Um, they were just what I, I actually happened to have access to both Kaplan and Princeton Review when I was um, studying for my MCAT, and I found that they were both pretty comparable. That that'll, that'll go this you know the same for about just about any content set you get your hands on. But I just found the Kaplan review books to be a little bit more um, colloquial, easy to understand, and I enjoyed reading them just a little bit more. Um, so that would be my number one recommendation. It is my number one recommendation to students. But if you happen to have any of these other, uh, other book sets, they're totally fine, right? All of these are largely the same material. What's important is that you just pick one and stick with it. Um, it you do not need to get multiple book sets so that they complement each other or anything like that. Any one of them will be enough. And if you're doing your, a lot of your practice, anything else will be covered. So, you know, like I said, content is the most important thing, but it is important. The most important thing is the practice that you do. Um, for practice, the gold standard far and away is going to be the AMC material. So these include the full lengths that they offer, the question packs, the section banks, and they recently released a new CARS diagnostic tool, which comes with, you know, uh, over 150 new CARS questions, which is a huge deal because AMC material is just so hard to come by and it's just the best material out there for practice. So one caveat there is that I would save the AMC material to the very end of your prep. So treat it like gold. That's what you want to save till the very end when you're sure you're taking the MCAT when you're taking it. And when you're absolutely, um, you know, you're in the, the swing of things, you've, you've done all your content review, you've gotten a lot of practice with, with practice questions. And that's when you break out the AMC stuff. Before then, what you want to use are the UWorld MCAT question bank. So UWorld is, uh, is a resource that doesn't offer any full links but it does offer nearly 2,000 uh, MCAT questions that are both passage-based and discrete, and they're amazing, right? Like, so they, they, they really mimic the um, style and depth of the AMCs, like the official MCAT resources. Um, so they're great for that reason, but the real, you know, the real reason why UWorld is such an amazing resource is that the solutions are amazing. They're super in depth. You like when you do practice, what's, what's more important than just doing the practice is how you review them. UWorld world makes that really easy for you by really giving you a in-depth uh, kind of review of every single answer choice for the questions you, you do, but also a high level conceptual review of the concepts that were just tested. So I can't recommend UWorld world enough. I absolutely think that um, it's worth the investment for your MCAT prep. Um, and then beyond that, another free resource that I think is great, which is unfortunately, you know, going away at the end of um, September next year, is are the Khan Academy passages. So there are lots and lots of Khan Academy passages uh, with associated questions for all four sections of the MCAT. I would definitely check those out. Um, they're great free resources as well to sprinkle in there. Something that's not listed here are third party full lengths. Um, like Kaplan offers them, Princeton Review offers them, uh, Blueprint offers them, um, Altius offers them. All of these are great. Um, I, my personal favorites are Blueprint and Altius, um, just because those full lengths are really representative of the, uh, the style of the MCAT. 
and your scores are going to be the most representative to the real thing. Um, but feel free to, to go with any uh, and use those as your full length practice before you, you know, make it to the AMC stuff in, your, in the very final stretch of your, your prep. So yeah, those are just a bit on, on resources if you're starting to think about, you know, what, you know, building the, the actual material you'll be using for your prep. And then finally, we'll get to our testing tips and strategies for the chem fist section. So, you know, there's so much out there. We'll talk more in the, the q and I'm sure, but um, I really want to distill it down to just a few things that I think are, uh, that I can truly get behind that I think will help students that really helped me when I took the MCAT. So when you're going through a, a science passage, it's really important that you understand, as I mentioned before, the central hypothesis or the, the goal of the experiment. And there will almost always be an experiment or a main idea being presented to you. Um, you know, I think that setting a rule for myself to just highlight the central hypothesis and goal of the experiment was really helpful for me because it made me look out for that when I was reading. And it also made me avoid just excessive highlighting, which I think is definitely something that hurts more than it helps um, on the MCAT. So always, always, always highlight the central hypothesis or goal of the experiment whenever you're going through a science uh, passage on the MCAT. Um, a little timing tip, and this is again, just one of those pragmatic things, is when you're going through the, the MCAT, read the entire passage um, you know, all the way through, but don't analyze the figures. So what I say is just read the figure titles. Um, because as I mentioned before, the figure titles are super informative. They'll, they'll basically tell you what the figure is supposed to tell you, right? A graph of something will say the effect of X on Y um, in so-and-so conditions, right? That's how scientific figures are named. And so you'll know when you're reading the, the passage that this figure answers that question or shows that relationship. And then you can just keep moving forward. The reason why you don't analyze the figures right then and there is because Analyzing figures is a majorly, you know, time intensive and attention intensive process um, that potentially may not show up in any of the questions. And that does, that does happen sometimes. So what I recommend is really just reading the figure titles. And then if a question calls upon a figure, then going back and using the tap method and really analyzing the figures. And that'll, that'll shave some, you know, a wasted time off of your um, off of your, your uh, actual practice. So this, this third one is one of my favorites and uh, it's, it's just one of my favorites because I wish I'd known this early on um, when I was prepping for the MCAT. It's scary when you see these like 20 letter words on the science sections and, and you're just like, what does that even mean? How do you even pronounce that? And you actually sit there and like, try to read it four times just to just to read it. Don't get lost in the sauce of the MCAT uh, on the science sections. The jargon is actually just jargon, you know? Again, going back to the theme where the concepts, the relationships are way more important than the minutia. The, the super specific names of things most of the time on the MCAT are unimportant. So get in the habit of really just shrinking, shrinking them down to acronyms or just even like, you know, protein A or enzyme B in your mind when you're reading through them. Um, and, and that little simple thing I think has, at least with the students I've worked with, it's, it's made a, like a substantial difference. And so I always like to say that in these, um, always simplify the jargon. The only, um, I guess, jargon that I, I would pay attention to is the class of the enzyme. So whether it's a peptidase or a hydrolase or um, a synthase, right? Those are things that you should know that give you a hint about the actual, you know, function of the enzyme. Though all the other stuff, you know, you don't need to know what an uh, a, like aceto, adeni, oxy, moron, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, that's not in the scope of the MCAT, and you're not going to be tested directly on that. Um, so this is a, the next point is really important for the chemist section because it's the most calculation heavy section on the MCAT. Um, and if, for those of you that do this already, that's wonderful. But for those that don't, always convert to scientific notation for all the calculations you do. 
um, get in the habit of that because scientific notation for all your calculations is really going to speed up the, you know, the math that you have to do on the MCAT because you can break things down just to single digit multiplication, right? If I ask you like, uh, this is terrible, I'm about to do math live, but if I ask you like, you know, what's, if the MCAT forces you to have to do a calculation like 500 um, or, or like 813.7 divided by, uh, you know, 24, right? I don't even remember the, the numbers I just said, but you would break that down to scientific notation. So the 800 would just become 8.13 times 10 squared and then divided by, uh, tw I said 27, right? So um, 2.7 times 10, right? Just converting it to scientific notation, we know how to combine the, the powers of 10 really easily when we're dividing. You just subtract the exponents. We also know how to divide single digits, right? Obviously, in this case, it's like 8.7 and 2.4. On the MCAT, you can round. And, uh, you know, you just round those to 9 and 3. And then you've got, you know, 3 times, I forget, I, it was like 10 squared and 10 to the first. So 3 times 10, right? 30. And, and that'll get you within range of the answer choices. So that's a very offhand example of how scientific notation can help you. If you don't trust me, take my word for it um, and try it out for yourself in your practice. Convert things to scientific notation, round uh, to the nearest integer for the integer portions, and you know, combining and multiplying or dividing the exponents is, is really easy um, or the powers of 10. And then finally, use dimensional analysis to find the answer Right. If you see all the answer choices are in units of joules, and you're given a uh, you're given a force, and you don't know what you know, you're given a force, and you don't know what else to multiply to to get to joules, you should hopefully know that you know that you should hopefully remember the um, that a joule. Right. If you if you if we take it back to what I mentioned about knowing the basic and derived SI units, you should know that a joule breaks down to a newton meter, right? And so if you're, you have a force, which is a newton, you know that the thing that's missing to get to the joules, which is what all the answer choices are in, is a distance or something in meters, right? And then you would go back to the passage and find sort of the relevant distance. A lot of times there's really only one. And that's why dimensional analysis can be so useful because I cannot understand the work being done at all. I cannot understand the concept of energy at all. But if I know the units and I see everything's in joules and I'm given a force, and I'm given a distance, I can know exactly what to do to, to arrive at the right answer, right? I know exactly what combination needs to happen to get to the right answer. So that's really what using dimensional analysis to find the answer means. Um, Cool. So awesome. So uh, let me just check time really quickly. So we've got about 15 minutes left to this um, session. So we'll just quickly go through a, a demo passage. And so this is a demo passage from the ChemPhys section that was actually taken from, uh, from Khan Academy. So again, a free resource that is available online. You can find this passage um, on Khan Academy if you, you'd like afterwards. Um, we're just gonna do a, a few questions here. I'm gonna go through this passage exactly um, like I would if I was taking it on, on the MCAT. So yeah, we'll just get started. And, and again, I'm gonna read the whole thing straight through. I'm not gonna get lost in the sauce, not gonna pay attention to the jargon. Just try to extract the main idea. And just because I don't have the highlighting function, I'm not gonna highlight, but um, I'll tell you exactly what I would highlight here. So acetone is the active ingredient in nail polish remover and is ubiquitous in chemistry laboratories. Most laboratories order acetone in bulk, not only for cleaning glassware, but also for use as a chemical reagent. One method for producing acetone is shown below. And I just see figure one is creating acetone using benzene and propene as reactants, right? Like I said, the figure title tells you everything. So I'm not gonna dive into this. Moving on. Acetone can also be produced from the decarboxylation of acetoacetic acid. So decarboxylation of, of some acid. At temperatures above zero degrees Celsius, 
acetoacetic acid spontaneously decomposes as shown in the following reaction. Now I'm just going to read the title again. Figure two is creating acetone through the decarboxylation of acetoacetic acid. So basically just the mechanism behind this sentence here about how acetone can be produced. And then finally, to isolate the products of these reactions, different techniques for separation and purification were utilized. The boiling points of some of these chemicals, along with other common reagents, are shown in the following table. So I would say that the main idea here is clearly the production of acetone. And you know, I don't know which sentence I would highlight here, but as long as I know what the main idea is, the central goal of the, the passage, I'm good. I'm happy with myself, right? Um, and then it, it ends with this, this uh, point about how to isolate the products of this, these reactants. And then there's a table at the end, which I couldn't fit on one page. So the table is um, just a compilation of the boiling points of common chemicals in a laboratory. And we're not going to really dive in any deeper. Um, cool. So pretty short uh, passage here, right? Just about producing acetone. So we're just going to dive into an example question. These are, you know, these are fair game. This is really the level of uh, detail some of the MCAT is. And it, it's hopefully um, showing you that it's not all bad and, and it's very doable. So this question says, when distilling a mixture of benzene, acetone, phenol, and naphthalene, I don't even know how to pronounce that, which compound would be distilled first? So when I read this question, I immediately want to focus on, you know, firstly, what is it really asking? What's important to know here, right? What's important to know here is distillation. They're asking you about if you distill the mixture of these compounds, which would be distilled first? So the fundamentals I want to call upon in my mind are how distillation works, right? And I, I, even if I don't remember all the details, I just should remember that distillation is a process where you separate a mixture, you know, by boiling it. And, and if they have diff if the, the mixture is made up of compounds that have different boiling points, then you're going to be able to, you know, isolate those, those compounds. So just a very basic understanding of distillation, right? And if that's something that I didn't know at this point, I would just make a point, this is just practice, I would write that down somewhere and make sure I get to it. I would highly recommend keeping an Excel sheet as you go along your, your practice of a lot of these concepts that you check yourself on and you're like, I'm not actually super certain here. So which compound would be distilled first, right? And I know that distillation is really about boiling points. So now really I can reword this question in my head as, you know, which compound would have the highest or lowest boiling point, right? Well, if distillation is about boiling them, whichever one would be distilled first would be the one that has the lowest boiling point. So now I've reframed this question as which compound of these is the lowest, has the lowest boiling point. Now, if I was, you know, falling for that common mistake, I would immediately rely on my background knowledge, right? I'm a super smart uh, kid. I remember my, my chemistry principles. I'm going to try and analyze which would have the, you know, the lowest boiling point based on their functional groups, right? I'll see an ene, I'll see a, uh, an alcohol here. So I know that, you know, one is more polar than the other. And so it'll probably have a higher boiling point. No, right? We always want to go to the passage first. And if you remember from the table, when you were reading carefully and slowly, you know that there's a table with a compilation of all the boiling points of common chemicals, right? And so what I would do here now is just really check off. Benzene is at 80 degrees Celsius boiling point. Acetone is 56 degrees Celsius boiling point. Phenol is 181. And naphthalene um, is 218. So out of those four, the lowest boiling point is going to be acetone. And that's going to boil off that's going to be distilled first, right? And all I did was use my fundamentals of distillation and then use the passage to get to the answer. So the next question, and you know, maybe we'll just do two questions because I want to leave some time for, um, for, for the Q&A. But the next question is just, which of the following pairs of chemicals can be best separated using simple distillation? So here again, we have another question about distillation and, and maybe I was a little bit off the mark with what the main idea of the passage was here, right? 
So the main idea might actually be very well about just uh, different techniques for separating compounds and, and acetone, the production of acetone was just sort of a lead up to that. So, okay, so the questions are kind of shaping my idea of the main idea. Um, so which of the following pairs of chemicals could best be separated using simple distillation? We just reviewed what distillation was. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of pairs of compounds, right? So knowing that distillation is about separating compounds based on boiling point, the ones that could best be separated using simple distillation, I would assume are just those with the biggest differences in boiling point, right? And again, I don't wanna use outside knowledge to judge what the boiling points will be. I'm just gonna use the table. Um, and just so there's not a lot of going back and forth here, um, you know, I think the answer ends up being acetone and formic acid, right? That's gonna have the biggest difference in, uh, in boiling point out of all these pairs. But what you would do on a real test is just, you know, go through one by one and figure out the difference. Um, and just really, really quickly, I know I said I'd skip this one, but this one is actually different than the distillation, right? Um, it's another chem concept that proves that it's really about high level fundamentals than about the, the, the details and memorization. Um, so this question is saying that benzene, phenol, acetoacetic acid, and ethanamine are all mixed together in a separatory funnel. If hydrochloric acid is added, which of these chemicals would be protonated? So what's happening here is we have four different compounds. We're adding an acid, and now we're being asked which of these chemicals would be protonated, right? So, you know, this is not something that we, sh we should not have memorized what happens, what the reactivity of all of these random compounds are, right? We don't even need to memorize what the reactivities of, um, you know, like these major functional groups are. Um, well, maybe, maybe knowing the reactivities of major functional groups matters, right? But that's, that's like a high level relationship. But what we're showing here is we're adding an acid and we're, we're asking where does the proton from that acid go out of these four choices? So if you just have a very basic understanding of, you know, of acid-based chemistry, right? Something that it seems a lot simpler than what the MCAT would ask. You would just say, you know, the proton from an acid goes to a base. It'll go to the most basic molecule. Now the question we can reframe as just which of these chemicals is the most basic, right? And, you know, that's a lot easier to answer. We know that acetic acid is going to be definitely not the most basic. It's got the word acid in it. Um, we know that an alcohol is not quite that basic. And a benzene might be neutral, right? There's, there's really not an acidic or a basic group there. But ethanamine, this amine group should ring a bell if we, you know, again, that's a, that's a high level kind of concept that comes up a lot in the, uh, in biochem and, and biology. An amine group is definitely basic. And so just by recognizing that and having reframed this question, we can answer this um, and pick D. So I just want to cover that one because it was something different than, than distillation. Um, but yeah, so just to sort of, wrap up with a message about MST. At MST, we're really all about, you know, again, working one-on-one -on -one with students to help them reach their potential. Um, you know, a lot of my work with students is about uh, tailoring their prep, their practice to their strengths and weaknesses and their schedule. So we'll build a really custom study, study schedule together. Um, during our tutoring sessions, we go over lots of best practices, tips and tricks that I think would help um, and reviewing the, their, you know, content weaknesses and problem solving weaknesses. Um, you know, it's very much something like uh, where we basically shape what we get out of the, the tutoring sessions together. And, you know, there will be some sessions like this where we'll, we'll you know, highlight a particular section, um, but others will just be, you know, going through passages together and really figuring out how to analyze them the best. Um, and it's, it, the tutoring goes beyond just those uh, weekly or, or you know, bi-weekly sessions. There's, I'm always in contact with my students, and that's something that you can expect at MST. And we're all about giving you the mentorship and support and guidance you need so, to, to really do your best on this exam. And with that, thank you all for coming, and, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening.